Hi, everybody. Hello. I have cue cards. Hi. Uh, welcome to the first of a series of events celebrating the 50th anniversary of the founding of both the Department of Linguistics and the Linguistics Language Program here at UCSD. Uh, yay. <laughs> Uh, so by way of introduction of our invited panelists, I'd like to say a few words about the relationship between the study of linguistics and the creation of constructed languages, which is, of course, the topic of tonight's events. Uh, before I begin that, though, if anybody needs sign language interpreting, we invite you to sit over here in the front two rows. There's some extra seats uh, if anybody needs sign language interpreting. Okay. So a question of specific interest to academic linguists is what does it take to describe a language? And a parallel question for constructed language creators, or conlangers as they're called, is what does it take to create a language? And I think the answer to these questions is mutually informative. Uh, the study of linguistics has involved the description of many languages, which has led to the development of theories designed to explain how languages work, how they're structured, how they're acquired, how they evolve over time, and so on. So for instance, we know that languages aren't just bags of words. Uh, instead, they're intricately structured. So for instance, sentences consist of words arranged in particular orders, uh, and they vary systematically across sentence types. So in English, for instance, uh, you have eaten a sandwich is a, a statement, and have you eaten a sandwich with the have and the you reversed in order is a question. Even the individual words of a language are structured. They're not just random sequences of sounds. So native English speakers know that a word like group is a real word of English. A word like gloop probably isn't, but it could be. And a word like gnoop definitely isn't. We also know that language learners are provided almost exclusively with indirect, scattered, and in many ways incomplete evidence for all of this structure, but that they nevertheless acquire all of the structure anyway. This means that the process of language acquisition must actually be kind of a language creation process. Language learners indirectly infer the structure or create it based on the fragmented experience uh, with, that they have with what is spoken around them. Now, conlangers, uh, and our three guests tonight in particular, I didn't ask them if they all self-identify as conlangers, but I'm just going to go ahead and call them that anyway. Uh, they're very familiar with what academic linguists have learned about real languages because they have spent time being academic linguists and have used that knowledge to inform the creation of their constructed languages, something we're sure to hear a lot about tonight. Now, as it happens, some academic linguists have also stolen or borrowed uh, conlangu uh, methods for our own needs. So there's a very promising area of research in linguistics today uh, that's called artificial language learning in which experimental subjects, you may have been some of them, uh, are exposed to training data in a language that has been carefully constructed to reveal several things about how languages work. And then you're tested on further items to see if you've learned something about those. Now, the results from these experiments are very interesting. Uh, but the artificial languages themselves in the context of the experiment are not very interesting, at least for the purposes of um, something like tonight. They're certainly not as interesting as the languages that have been uh, constructed by these three linguists that we'll be discussing tonight, um, in particular because they're associated with a people, usually an alien race, which is always exciting, uh, a culture, and of course, Hollywood. So our first guest tonight is Mark Okrand, uh, a UC alumnus through and through, having received his bachelor's degree in linguistics from UC Santa Cruz and his PhD in linguistics from UC Berkeley. Mark is the creator of Klingon, which was created specifically for the Star Trek movies. And thank you. All right, so you're probably all familiar with Star Trek then, I take it. Okay. Um, now, of course, Klingon has sort of taken on a life of its own in our own universe, um, extending well beyond the confines of Star Trek and something that I think you'll really appreciate from the following clip. Open, 
Klingon style. Klingon style. Kapon rock tar, eku saka blajita. Yui dato, chakale kuku kerbin bajamau. New host tar, nuk por mak 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 shuku hamarush. Kalaj himnes ku blajani kudo marush. Watcha por mak ku blaj. <laughs> Mark wants to know if he should apologize for that now. <laughs> um, by the way, that's the first link that I found when I googled Klingon language. <laughs> All right, our second guest is Paul Fromer, who holds a bachelor's degree in mathematics from the University of Rochester and a PhD in linguistics from the University of Southern California. Now, Paul is the creator of Navi for the movie Avatar, and more recently of Barsoomian, of the movie John Carter. And this video clip from Avatar illustrates Navi. What are you? I was a Marine. Or it would if it worked. <laughs> What are you? I was a Marine. A, uh, a warrior of the Jarhead clan. Some Siupak? What's who know it's Pivanev to it? It will allow me to run your son to you. That's all I am. Or I am Gara Lutekin, a Numanul. It is decided. Our third guest is David Peterson, another through and through UC alumnus who holds bachelor's degrees in English and linguistics from UC Berkeley and a master's degree in linguistics from right here at UC San Diego. Now, David is co-founder and president of the Language Creation Society and is the creator of Dothraki for the HBO series Game of Thrones. And he's also now the alien language and culture consultant. How awesome is that? <laughs> for the sci-fi original series Defiance that just began airing this week, here's a clip from Game of Thrones. Need to see this. Yes, blood of my blood. Who did this? Calpono, perhaps. Called Giago. They don't like the idea of a woman leading a calisar. They will like it far less when I am done with them. Come on! 
That last line wasn't translated, but I think it was, ah. <laughs> All right. Our moderator tonight is Grant Goodall, yet another through and through UC alumnus with a bachelor's degree in linguistics from UCLA and a PhD in linguistics from UC San Diego. So Grant is Professor of Linguistics and Director of the Linguistics Language Program here, and for reasons that will become apparent shortly, he is the perfect person to be moderating this panel discussion. So here's how, is it, how it's going to go. After some introductory remarks from our moderator, Grant, the panelists will discuss matters related to the topic of language creation for about 45 minutes, led by questions from the moderator. Then we'll invite questions from the audience for about another 30 minutes, and we'll conclude and all stick around for a reception. So enjoy. To carai gesamideanoi, carai cestantoi, mi bon venigas vin al nia programo ho dia vespere, kie ni celebras inter alie la quindec iaran da trevenon de la fondigio de la faco prilinguistico en nia universitato. Hodiaŭ ni parolos pri la lingvoj kiujn oni kreas specife por la celo de filmo kaj televido produktaĵoj. Niaj honoraj gastoj estas la kreintoj de tri el tiuj lingvoj. Kaj fakte temas pri tri el la plej famaj kaj elstaraj ekzemploj de tiuj lingvoj. Do pro tio mi salutos vin ĉiujn hodiaŭ en tiuj tri lingvoj. Unue mi salutos vin en la klingona lingvo per la esprimo nuknech. Kai poste dua loko en la navia loko mi salutos vin per la vorto kalti. Kai en la dotrakia lingvo per la esprimo math. Now in case you didn't catch all that. Um, <laughs> I just said hello to you, among other things, in uh, Klingon. Uh, and I don't know a lot about Klingon culture, but I gather that uh, if someone greets you in Klingon, you probably don't want to be rude. So you would probably, so if someone tells you nuknech, you probably want to respond with nuknech. So let's try this again. <laughs> nuknech. <laughs> All right. And uh, the Navi people, at least, are sometimes more gentle and understanding. They didn't maybe look like it in that clip. Uh, but in any event, uh, one wants to be gentle and understanding in return. So if someone tells you, kalti, you should probably say, kalti, in return. So, kalti. Kalti. Better. And I know even less about Dothraki culture, but I do know that you really, really, really don't want to get a Dothraki mad. <laughs> so if someone tells you, greets you with math, you'll probably want to respond uh, likewise. So math. math. You know, I think we don't have quite enough surliness in the voice there, so um, try that again. Math. <laughs> so, okay, uh, the rest of what I said was in Esperanto, a language that was invented in the late 1800s. Okay, now some of you now can recognize that. Um, this was invented in the late 1800s. It's actually a language I've spoken most of my life. It's a language that next to English I feel the most comfortable in. Um, the reason I bring this up is because we're trying to give some context, some historical intellectual context to what we're talking about. Because I know a lot of times when you talk about invented 
when you mention that word invented languages, what comes to mind is sweaty sci-fi geeks who have way too much free time on their hand <laughs> and uh, sort of create, create languages. But what people don't realize is, is that there is a very long and noble intellectual tradition of creating languages. So if you go back to the times of Leibniz, for example, the great German philosopher and mathematician, the guy who invented calculus, basically. Um, he was very much concerned with the idea of creating a language that would reflect the reality of the world around us. So if you think about this for a moment, think about the animals, uh, dogs and wolves. You know from experience, you know from biology class, that dogs and wolves are very, very similar. Uh, but think about the words that we use to express those ideas. Dog, wolf. They have nothing in common, right? So the concepts are very closely related. The words could hardly be more different. Now think about uh, our words, dog, God. Well, as Woody Allen first pointed out, uh, you know, dog is just God spelled backwards. And there's a lot of truth in that, that they have the same sounds, just ordered slightly differently. So how, you know, so our language has these two words being very similar, but presumably, I mean, this depends on your theology, but presumably the, the concepts behind those words are quite different. Now, wouldn't it be wonderful if the language that we spoke, the words that we used, actually reflected the reality of the, word, uh, of the world around us? Well, that's what Leibniz thought, and that's what many of his contemporaries thought as well. And he was so devoted to that idea that he uh, began to create a kind of prototype of a language, a sketch of a language, that would do exactly that, where things that were um, similar in the real world would be similar in the language as well. Now that language, that sketch of a language that he first created is, is no one pays attention to it anymore. Um, but the basic idea, the thrust of the idea behind that is something that still influences us today. So if you think, for instance, about the system that we use of uh, scientific names for names of plants and names of animals, where you have the, you know, things like Homo sapiens, where you've got the genus and the species names. That really comes out of the times from Leibniz, and it meets the ideal that Leibniz was, was striving for. If you look at two animals and see their scientific names, you can tell by looking at the names whether they are related or not. And in other more distant ways, things like our periodic table of the elements, Dewey decimal systems, and very, various forms of classification actually have their, ultimately their roots in Leibniz and Leib Leibniz's contemporaries who uh, were interested in those sorts of issues. So let's uh, uh, fast forward now to the late 1800s um, when international travel and communication uh, were uh, rather suddenly became available to many, many people in a way that just wasn't possible before in human, human history. This was because of expansion of the railroads, uh, expansion or the invention of the use of the telegraph, the uh, International Postal Union, and the growth of a, of a strong middle class that was able to afford to travel to other places at a level that was just not precedented. Um, uh, compared to earlier. So this was a new experience that masses of people were having of, of traveling to other places. And that those new experiences led to new ways of thinking. Uh, and primarily this idea that people in other countries uh, are really like us at heart. These are our brothers and sisters. They may have been born somewhere else. They may carry a different type of passport. Uh, but ultimately they are they are just like that. So this sort of idea that in, in those times would have been expressed as, you know, all men are brothers, this became very strong in the late, the late 1800s. But at a practical level, this was difficult to implement because people didn't speak the same language. So at that time, dozens of languages were created, and Esperanto was one of them, but there were many others that were created at that time which were designed to be easy to learn and that would somehow help help foster this international understanding. Um, most of those languages uh, are long gone and, and forgotten, but that basic idea still influences us today. And so, in fact, uh, at the time, that idea that people in other places are more or less like us and we should try to understand them, 
This is something that most of us take for granted, perhaps not as a reality, but as something that we should, we should strive for. Uh, at the time, it was more of a sort of uh, radical, sometimes even subversive idea, but it's something that, that we still carry with us and still consider to be a, a desirable goal. Um, the language uh, the language Esperanto uh, is still around. Uh, people are still attracted to it. People are still people still uh, learn it. Uh, the language itself has kind of taken its place among languages of the world. If you look at number of speakers, it's somewhere like around around uh, the same as Icelandic or Latvian or languages like that. That is not a huge language, but not endangered either. And um, and there's this growing phenomenon of Esperanto-speaking households or Esperanto-speaking families, um, where there's you know, currently probably about 1,000 um, children, native-speaking Esperanto children. And there are even uh, many cases of families where, now, where this has gone on for generations. And so we now have the second or third or fourth generation of Esperanto being the language of uh, that family or one of the languages of that family. So looking at these languages of the past, whether from the 1600s or the 1800s or early 20th century, this can be a fascinating exercise. Um, but when we do it, we have this tremendous advantage that we're at a distance from them. So we can, we can look back, explore and examine the factors that went into creating these languages. We can see how they evolved over time, and we can see how they continue to influence us today in sometimes subtle but interesting ways ways. With languages like Klingon, uh, Navi, Doth Dothraki, of course we don't have that advantage. Uh, we're, we're close to them. Uh, we don't have that historical distance. But we do have some other advantages uh, that we don't have with the older languages. Namely, these languages uh, like Klingon, Navi, Dothraki are languages of our times, languages that reflect our times. And the people that created them and the first people that uh, speak them uh, are with us uh, today. And in fact, in, in our case this evening, the people that created the language are literally with us today. <laughs> so we can talk to them and find out uh, from them uh, their perspective on what these languages are, what it means, where things are going, and the like. So with that, let's begin. So, Mark Okren, Paul Fromer, David Peterson, welcome. Welcome to UCSD. Welcome back to UCSD. Um, so, just for the, uh, for the public, what our game plan, which the speakers already know about, is uh, we're going to talk first some about the, the languages themselves, what goes into the sort of nuts and bolts of the languages. We're then going to talk about the the showbiz side of things, looking at the movies and shows and the sort of production of things. And then, uh, and then we'll talk a bit about the, the fans and the fan base uh, at the end, which we have some examples in the audience, I believe. <laughs> so, okay. <laughs> More than I thought, maybe. So to get us started looking at the language, um, uh, I think concentrating primarily on the sounds, one of the things that strikes me as interesting is that on the one hand, you have to make the language seem sufficiently exotic. Uh, for some of you, this is a language of another species, uh, or at least people you know, living on another planet. Uh, you have to make the language seem sufficiently exotic, but on the other hand, it has to be something that the audience can relate to. So I'm wondering if that's, if there's a sort of tension between those two that you had to struggle with, or if you had some, some way of addressing those types of concerns? Mm -hmm. I'd like to. Sure. Yes, that, um, <laughs> that's a good answer. Um, one, one of the things I had to think about a lot was I wanted to make up a language that sounded like no other, that sounded like it was not a, not a human language, because that was my instructions. On the other hand, it had to be spoken by real human actors. So, so they had to be able to say all of these things. There wasn't going to be any electronic enhancement or anything like that. Uh, I was a little bit lucky, I guess, because I did not start from scratch. 
uh, Klingon existed before I did, Klingon language existed before I got involved with it. Uh, if you know those Star Trek movies, the very first movie, the opening scene, is Klingons. Uh, and they speak. And there's maybe half a dozen lines, uh, commands barked out, and then the ships get zapped, they're gone, and the rest of the movie is what happened to the Klingons, because they're not in it anymore. Uh, <laughs> but, but, but you see, you hear Klingon, and there's subtitles. And uh, some of you know this, but for those who don't, those uh, words, that language was made up by James Doohan, the actor who played Scotty. He doesn't say them. Uh, mm -hmm. Another actor says them, but he, he made them up. And I didn't know that when I got involved. I found that out afterwards. But that was the start. So whatever sounds he had, I incorporated. And the basic syllable structure that he had, I incorporated and expanded from that. But in expanding from that, I had a couple of things in mind. Well, one was I had to do what the script said. The script said so-and-so Klingon character says in his guttural Klingon. <laughs> okay, the script says it's guttural, therefore it's going to be prominent <laughs> Klingon. And also what I was just saying before, I had to, had to make it sound, sound weird, and, but still pronounceable. So there's nothing, there's no sounds in Klingon that you can't find in some human language somewhere or other. But the collection of sounds is unique. Uh, languages are patterned. They, they, things tend to go together, things tend to not go together. Uh, and I violated those rules in putting, picking the sounds for Klingon mm. because if it violated the human language tendencies, that would make it sound more alien. At least that was my thinking. I see. Interesting. Um, my experience was somewhat similar to Mark's. I too did not start from scratch because it turns out that in thinking about Navi, uh, James Cameron had come up with about 30 words on his own, which were in the original script. Uh, they were mainly names of characters, names of places, and so on. So I looked at those, and they had kind of a vaguely Polynesian feel to them. So I kind of took that as a base, but then expanded out. Um, you talk about exotic. Of course, what is exotic? Well, what's exotic to speakers of English is not necessarily exotic to speakers of Thai or Vietnamese or uh, Amharic. Uh, but I want to add some interest to the sound of the language. So what we finally decided on, by the way, I, I tried various things. I came up with, um, at the very beginning, came up with things that I called sound palettes, which were examples of the way the language might possibly sound. Each one had a particular characteristic. So for example, I tried uh, tone. Those of you who speak Chinese know that uh, the same combination of consonants and vowels in Chinese, depending upon how your voice goes, if it goes up or goes down, can mean something totally different. So Chinese, you have ma, 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 and those are totally <laughs> different words. Okay. So I tried that, and he didn't like that. I tried um, distinctive vowel length, so that pa, pa, and pa could mean different things. He didn't like that. But what he did wind up liking uh, was these sounds called ejectives, which sound like oh and ah, uh, ah. Uh, they're real human, they're real, sounds found in real human languages, they're found in uh, many Native American languages, they're found in Amharic, they're found in uh, Central Asia and so on. So um, those are some of the sounds that, that, that I used. Just like Mark, the actors had to be able to say all of these sounds so that uh, all of the sounds in Navi are pronounceable, or, or I should say are found in one human language or another, but the combination is unique. And the way the sounds interact is unique. So uh, the combinations of sounds, the consonant clusters, have to be thought about. So those are some of the elements of the, of the sound system. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, at least with, with, uh, with Dothraki and, and also with High Valyrian, I started with some material there. Uh, the, uh, the, the different thing is that it was all written. So it was uh, George R. R. Martin wrote it out, and he wrote it out in a, a romanization that he devised kind of off the cuff. And so uh, I, I basically had to analyze how I, thought that he, the, how I thought that he thought these things were pronounced, and also how the fans of the books would probably think they were pronounced. And I think that uh, I came pretty close at least to the latter. Um, it turns out he is... Uh, <laughs> I mean, he's from New Jersey, but he's got a very strange way of speaking. So, um, <laughs> no, it's true. Like, so, um, what you know, what everybody looks at when you look at the spelling of Dothraki, everybody pretty much says, "Oh, Dothraki, whatever." He doesn't say that. He he pronounced it uh, Dothraki. 
Um, <laughs> he does that very, very consistently. I don't know if you're watching Game of Thrones this season, but there's the, can the character of Miss Sandy. Uh, he, he also says Miss Andi. Um, and I don't think I would have ever predicted that, but anyway. So that's all right. I got close enough to what the fans were expecting. But um, so uh, for, for, uh, for Dothraki, you know, I, I kind of analyzed the sound system there and filled it out so that it was naturalistic because that was, that was the goal when you're creating these things. If there are real people, they need to have a language uh, that's going to look like it's appropriate to them and also that it evolved throughout history and so forth. But um, so I, I kind of stuck with that. I got rid of one of the vowels because I didn't like it because I don't like the vowel ooh. So I figured, you know. Um, <laughs> Pretty, Sorry. Uh, but you know, it's, it, it's not actually very uh, surprising to have like an O and an U vowel merge at some point in time. So that's just what I had those do. The, the vowel system actually looks, looks just like Babylonian, except where Babylonian has the U, Dothraki has O. So I figure, yeah, whatever, it's good. But um, <laughs> of course, so when I was doing, you know, the, the other languages, like languages for defiance, where it was pretty much just uh, me going. You know, I knew that, first of all, the only languages, the only sounds that both languages had have was th, th, because everybody's in love with that sound. Uh, the, the languages, the names of the languages, Dothraki, Castathan, Erathian, it's like when people are coming up with these, you know, uh, made up names for foreign cultures, they love th. They just think that's the cat's pajamas, so they just <laughs> say that in there all the time. But um, I figured out a couple of things. One, um, actors uh, they get pretty adventurous and they're pretty good about pronouncing like consonants um, different vowel sounds they those are kind of lost on them so I try to keep <laughs> the vowels simple and then throw in like uh, one or two consonants that might be a little bit tougher or at least putting them in different positions so like a post vocalic H which you have in Arabic in lots of languages you don't have in English uh, something like uh, sabah it's an Arabic word for Saturday um, but uh, you know, so it's like you try to make it naturalistic, and then I also try to throw in something so that it's not completely just recycling the same set of sounds. And usually you can do that with phonotactics. That is the way that um, consonant clusters work, the way that syllables work, and the way that it all gets put together. Um, anyway, and they all did a pretty good job. Okay. So, okay, so you've, you've got your sounds. You've got, you know, this inventory of sounds for your, your language. But then, of course, you have to put them together into words. And this, this part sounds very frightening to me because you've got, I mean, eventually you're going to have hundreds and hundreds of, of words. Um, did you have some system for coming up with them or some you know, muse that sat on your shoulder and inspired you to, I mean, what, uh, what maybe, maybe go in reverse order this okay. time. What, well, what, 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 how, how did you get inspired to create the actual words? Well, I, I, I had a different uh, method for, for each language I did. So uh, the way that I like to think of it is, uh, I almost like to think of it as, when it comes to lexical generation as far as the, uh, the engine that runs it. So it's like I, I got a couple different ideas for how this works. And so for like, uh, for, for Dothraki and Erathian, I used uh, kind of this language engine that I first toyed with with an earlier language of mine called Gieler. And then with uh, Castathin and High Valyrian, I, I used the same basic engine that I ran for Kamakawi. But um, what I kind of mean by that is like with, um, with Dothraki and Arathian, these will be the easiest to explain. Um, you often, at least, uh, English is kind of a bad example for this, but um, Latin may be a better example. But if, in English, you have, uh, let's say, if you just have a word like um, house. You have uh, other words that incorporate the word house, like house, housing, to house, halfway house, um, a bunch of other words with house that I just listed. Um, I mean, I didn't, but you know what they are. A bunch of words have house in them. Um, and so you, you see there's like a kind of a common root, and then lexemes kind of get built out around it. Uh, some languages do this in much, uh, kind of in much greater frequency, something like you'd see in Inuktitut or Turkish. And so um, with both of these languages, I started with roots. And roots tend to have a very similar pattern. So it's like they'll, they'll be your CVC root, uh, consonant, vowel, consonant, root. In Arathian, there are a lot of roots that uh, start with two consonants, have a vowel and end with a consonant. And um, for each of those, they do it in kind of different ways. But it's like the, the ways that you add affixes to a word will change ultimately what the word is. So like, you know, in, in Arathian, let's see, one of the roots is like a pasku, which doesn't mean anything, it's just a root. But uh, spasku is somebody who's like a gossip. But um, 
Hapaski is somebody who's like a, a, a gossip, but it's like really bad. It's like a, somebody who libels or slanders. Uh, and then Tapascu is uh, libel or slander. And then there's um, uh, Tipascu is kind of like this chatty bird. That was where the root came from. There's a little bird, uh, a native bird on their home world that goes Anyway, so um, that, was, <laughs> that was the origin of this root. I kind of expanded out to these other areas. So yeah, that's kind of like how those languages work. I start with these roots and then build out and kind of flesh out a little lexical pattern for whatever that root is. And then the others are kind of different, but you know, huh. too much. Go. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, before I began constructing roots, I had to have what linguists call the phonotactic constraints very well in place. You know, what does a syllable look like in this language? Uh, what consonant clusters can begin a syllable? Do you have any consonant clusters at the end? The answer is no. Only a certain subset of consonants can occur at the end of a syllable. So when that was clear in my mind, uh, the process was kind of slow and not terribly organized. Uh, I like to roll things around in my mouth when I'm taking a shower, for example, and just kind of try various things. And what would be a good word for head? What would be a good word for run? That sort of thing. Um, so the development of roots was a little bit slow. It's still kind of slow, which is one of the reasons that maybe I haven't uh, gotten quite as many as many vocabulary items as uh, as I would like right now. But uh, the other thing that you have to think about is what sort of meaningful elements that are not words will go into words. Mm -hmm. So things that ling linguists call morphemes. You know, what are your nouns going to look like? Are they going to have endings that indicate grammatical function? If so, what kind of cases are they going to be? Uh, what about verbs? Will they be inflected for person and number? Is it going to be tense in the language? Is it going to be aspect? Whether or not something is looked at as complete or incomplete? So all of those things um, have to be thought about as well. In a few cases, I did what we might call sort of constructing words that exhibit iconicity. We use that to to indicate uh, in semiotics, actually, a situation where a symbol, where the form of the symbol actually reflects something about what it means. So um, the word multisyllabic is, in fact, multisyllabic. <laughs> okay. uh, so it's one of the linguistic universals, not absolute, but it's a tendency that words that indicate smallness have small vowels, namely high vowels like e and i. So the word for small is he. Uh, words that indicate largeness often have big vowels. A big vowel is ah, where the mouth is open. So in Navi, small is he and big is tsao. So those are some of the uh, some of the thought processes that went into yeah. constructing the words. Interesting. Yeah. Mark, do you? Have I did it the other way around. <laughs> big, the word for big is tin because it's i, so it's exactly what you did. Before. As in English. <laughs> yeah, right. Exactly. Well, it's yeah. kind of like right. big and small in English. Exactly, right. yeah, exactly. <laughs> but there's a bunch of those in Klingon. Uh, what I did is, again, starting with, starting with Jimmy Doohan's words, which I didn't know what they were, is he's got a, a phrase three syllables long and a subtitle. Is that one word or two words or three words? I don't know. So I made an arbitrary decision. Three syllables, this particular three syllables, the first syllable is one word and the next two is a second word. I don't know why, because you have to start somewhere. So that sort of gave me the basic structure of what a word is. Words can be one syllable, they can be two syllables for the most part. Uh, then I had my certain sounds and uh, did the same thing. What, what can a syllable be? And what I ended up doing initially, uh, after making the decisions about are there gonna be prefixes and suffixes and all that sort of thing, is I made a big chart of all the possible syllables, mm. crossing out the ones that sounded like certain English words that I knew could never be in a movie or on TV, <laughs> <laughs> and then as making up the vocabulary, just eeny, meeny, my you, you know, yeah. uh, <laughs> you, and so on and so on until until thought. That's what I did initially. As time went on, I started, and the language started taking form. Then I started thinking about it uh, a little differently because it wasn't quite so arbitrary. This is a word that's in the family of words with something or other, so maybe there should be some kind of connection or something like that. Uh, and over time, because I did this at first a teeny bit, 
uh, but then I got, I don't know, mean or something. Uh, and I would say that now, I don't know, a third to a half, not a third of the Klingon words are really bad puns. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well actually this brings me to the next question I was going to ask about whether there were any like inside jokes in terms of, <laughs> you know, that the, that the audience wouldn't necessarily get, uh, you know, or someone just hearing the language wouldn't get, but that you know that, you know, the word for beer is your favorite beer spelled backwards or something. The word, the word, for, the, the word for beer is hick. <laughs> <laughs> it took me a minute. And it sounds, like, it sounds like earlier you mentioned something that for a linguist might be a kind of inside joke if the, if the, word, for, if the word for large has the vowel that's usually used right. for, yeah, for small and vice versa. So. You know, uh, when I was uh, when I was applying, because uh, the way that uh, the way that I came at least to the first job for, for Death Rocky for Game of Thrones, um, you know, it was with we were with a whole a whole cohort of uh, language creators, uh, some of whom were quite famous within the community, like uh, Sonia Ellen Kesa and, and John Quixada, for example. And so when we got to um, the second round, the final round. Uh, and there were finally uh, four of us left, John Quijada, Bill Weldon, and, um, and, and Simone Olivier. We, we decided to, uh, you know, whoever of us, uh, whoever, us uh, whoever of us won, we should have um, some Easter eggs for each other in the language. So, uh, and, uh, and, and John came up with, you know, just some, some gloriously crude examples. So we kind of uh, went with that. So what is it? So uh, John's language, Ithkuil, uh, it's in, in Dothraki, Ithkuil means, um, what does it mean? It means like um, breakable brittle, you know, because this, this language is so famous for being, you know, expansive and huge. I thought, <laughs> there you go. John, John's a good friend, John's a good friend. And then let's see, uh, um, uh, oh, oh, Bill, uh, Bill was to, Bill is a uh, because there's no um, B and V have merged into Thraki. His is uh, to manage to, like, you know, he's managed to make it to the second round. And then let's see what Simone, oh, Simone was just, I felt kinder to him, so he's just a general male relation. Oh, Simon, he's a male relation. <laughs> <laughs> and then, of course, uh, my wife in the audience has a couple of words, um, one of which actually made it, and I was so excited. Because like, I, I, often they, they would give me these lines that would come up after the scripts were already translated and say, oh, can you do this line? And they'd, they'd just pull these random ones out of there. So like, one of them was like, like why don't... Uh, one of the actresses up there and the fellow whose head you saw on screen there, they are having a conversation where um, the, the one says, you know, why don't you go get these foods? And one of them was, was uh, uh, why don't you get some, it was like rabbit or duck, I think it was. And of course, you know, duck is my name for my wife. And so the word for duck is Allegra, which is her middle name. <laughs> oh. Where is, where is she? <laughs> she's, she's somewhere. Aaron, where are you? She's got a bunch of words in all my languages. She's not going to raise her hand now. Okay. Just then everybody will look at her. All right. That somehow now makes that scene with the severed head seem much more romantic. <laughs> <laughs> Poor guy. He was great. I loved him. <laughs> so, yeah. um, Navi has a few such terms, not very many. Uh, they're mostly ways that I wanted to honor people who I particularly admired who are important to me. So uh, sometimes I would take a name and spell it backwards, if it fit into the Na'vi sound system. Right. Sometimes I would take a name and sort of filter it through the Na'vi sound system. There aren't more than about um, maybe f three or four of those. But what I have been thinking since the vocabulary is still being developed is sort of going in the other direction. Like, for example, we don't have a word for disgusting. You know, if there's someone I particularly don't like, or, you know, maybe I could do something like that. So oh. that's, that's, that's in the future. There, <laughs> that's coming up. There is a, there is a word in there um, that has to do with impotence, uh, whose name is uh, some sort of associate producer that uh, oh. ran afoul of me. I won't say which. It wasn't Dave and Dan. Those guys are awesome. <laughs> so you're, you're much, much kinder than... <laughs> Or I might think a bunch of kind of, it's odd for a Klingon to be kind, because if I came up with a word for something bad, mm. okay, uh, and it sounded like somebody's name, not, not necessarily somebody that I knew, mm -hmm. but a name, I'd say, oh, no, that's not fair. That, that, that poor person will be associated forever with that bad meaning, so I wouldn't do yeah. that. <laughs> <laughs> OK, 
Okay, I'm beginning to be happy that my name has many English-specific consonant clusters <laughs> show up in your languages. So, um, of course, as a linguist, we could go on and on about the, the various structural questions, but let me just ask one more type of question that I, I think is interesting, is that none of the languages, at least the, the three languages that, are, that we're mainly looking at here, none of them is, is particularly simple in its uh, structure. So they all have, at the very least, a complex case or agreement system or both. And, you know, so when I think about it, I think, well, why, you know, they're not going to know the difference. Why, why didn't you just take the path of least resistance and just, you know, whip out a language with, that had no inflection or morphology, that just, you just put the words together and it would be, it would be fine. You could have gotten the job done much faster and wouldn't have, it just seems a lot easier. But, but none of you, at least on these languages, none of you took that, that route. So, um, mm -hmm. Mark, maybe you were the pathbreaker. Because I was doing it. I want to have a good time while I was doing it. Um, it's, it's much more interesting to make up something that has a little bit of complexity. Because um, you, get, you get to figure out these systems and yeah. trick yourself into thinking you know what you're talking about and, and things like that. So I, I did it, you know, frankly, for me as much as anyone else. And also, I did it, I did it for other linguists. Okay, I didn't realize well, that when I started. But when I was into it, I, was real, I, I realized, no, Linguists will get this. Nobody else will, but it still sounds okay, so I'll keep it. You know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's all right, but, but it, it, was, it was to make it more, more, more fun and also more real. I mean, the, the, the point of doing this stuff in the first place was to make, make the movies seem more real. That's weird for Klingons to be real. But anyway, <laughs> uh, but it, it, was, it, was, it, was, it was to add some reality to it. So in the same way that, that in Star Trek in particular, but other things too, paid a lot of attention to science, to, to hard science, to astrophysics or whatever it is, and incorporated that stuff and then expanded from that and made some stuff up, you know, because mm. it takes place in the future. Uh, the, the language, I, you know, I thought and they thought uh, should, should sort of be the same thing. It should be based on the way languages really, really work so that it'll sound real and work, mm. work like a real language does and fit in with the culture and all that sort of thing. Yeah, yeah okay. I, I, I had um, quite a few similar uh, considerations. Uh, I wanted it to be fun for me. I also had a sense, uh, kind of a premonition in a way, that, that people, not necessarily linguists, but people, <laughs> would be looking at the language and examining it with a fine tooth comb. So I, I wanted to make it interesting for people. Um, I also wanted to push the envelope a little bit. I mean, this is a language spoken on a moon going around a gas giant in the Alpha Centauri star system, it shouldn't be too close to a human language and yet still have human characteristics. So I, I, um, I wanted to see kind of how far I could go with certain things that human languages do. So for example, the verbs have a fairly complex tense and aspectual system and that's all done through infixes, through taking a root and shoving something in the middle of a root. Now you find that in human language, but not as extensively as in Navi. Uh, I should add that when I created Barsoomian for John Carter, it was a very, very different situation because there's a line in the first book on which the movie is based where the narrator is saying, the language of Mars is so simple that I was able to master it in a week and I could understand everything that was said to me and express all my thoughts. Now, no language has ever been that simple. That would be great. But I said to myself, okay, well, this gives me license to create the simplest possible language, and so I did. And so that was a very different kind of experience. No. <laughs> Seriously, though, that, that would be incredible. Can you imagine if there was a language like that? Wouldn't that be a simple? A week? Yeah. <laughs> Take yeah. that. But uh, so, um, you know, when I was... Uh, when I was, you know, hired for, for Game of Thrones, I was coming through uh, a long process uh, where the, the job was advertised amongst the language creation community out of which I came. Uh, I started creating languages in 2000. Uh, uh, Game of Thrones came along in 2009. And um, I came out of a tradition, you know, basically the, the, the artistic language tradition. There are basically three types of languages, uh, engineered languages, auxiliary languages, uh, like Esperanto, and then um, artistic languages. 
which, uh, at least uh, online, have taken the form mostly of the naturalistic language, a language that looks as if it could uh, exist somewhere on Earth. Um, and so, uh, more than anything else, uh, especially since I was the one, basically the first one ever to create languages, who was hired to create a language, um, I wanted to honor this tradition and honor the community that I came from. Uh, I knew that I was going to be looked at a lot, mainly from the people within the language creation community, and what I was creating was going to be judged. Uh, they knew my previous work, but I wanted to do something better, and so um, yeah, I, I really uh, that that was why I really employed the the historical approach, uh, starting with a proto language and evolving the language up to a point. Uh, and I did that with uh, with all of them. Like uh, you know, I've now done alien languages for Defiance, but um, uh, honestly, when it comes to alien languages or languages for aliens, I look at the aliens first and ask just how different from humans are they? And it's like, yeah, they look different, they might have some different facial structure, but basically they're not different enough from humans to warrant a language that's too different from a naturalistic human language. Uh, or, or at least, you know, kind of like the, the, aliens, the aliens of defiance. They still, you know, have offspring, care for their offspring, you know, want to ensure that the offspring lives to maturity, and they form themselves into communities. Uh, and so, you know, I, language is basically a social phenomenon. And the way that they socialize is not too dissimilar from the way that human groups are dissimilar from one another. And so I, I figured it should be probably as dissimilar as human languages are from each other. And as you know, that can be quite dissimilar. If you've ever looked at any Australian language, you'll know it's pretty, it's pretty darn dissimilar. I often think that they're just making that up, those Australian <laughs> languages. They're <laughs> <laughs> wonderful. But, um, so, but really, though, as kind of like, you know, I, I was going to be the kind of the, the flagship member or the banner, the banner carrier for the language creation community. And I wanted to show that um, especially since the early 90s when we've been able to communicate and share with each other and learn from each other that we've learned a lot, we've been getting better at this, and that we hope to continue to get better. Mm. Okay, so let's move on to the aspect of, of the production of uh, the more showbiz uh, side of things. Um, and I think one thing that intrigues a lot of people, myself included, is how the language gets from you, the people who create the language, and then translate the lines that are needed, how it gets from you to the actors. So, um, David, I know I've seen uh, uh, programs on TV where they've shown you uh, recording lines. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, how, did, how did, did any of you work directly with actors, or how, how, how did that happen? Anybody who could. Let's start over with people that did. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, what I, what I did, the general procedure was well, when I first did it with, with Klingon, I did Vulcan before I did Klingon, but that was a whole different process. For Klingon, what I did is I wrote it all out. I had to figure out a transcription system since I was going to give them a little script. Uh, and for the sounds that were the same as English, you know, A is in father, that kind of thing, that was, that was fine. For the sounds that were not in English, how am I going to write them? And I could not assume that all of the actors would understand the International Phonetic Alphabet or something like that. <laughs> Although some, some do. Yeah. Um, so I made up an arbitrary system, and I used capital letters for, to mean, this is not what it normally is in English, it's something special, here's what it is. Hmm. So the capital H is the kh, the capital Q is kh, that's different from kh. Uh, uh, I use a capital I, so it always pronounce I, never pronounce E, just as a reminder kind of thing, and so on. Um, so I wrote, wrote all those things out, and then I made recordings, then, then on cassette tape, uh, and sent them to, to Paramount. Uh, Paramount reproduced these tapes and gave it to the actors, and they put it in the cassette players in their cars, right, and <laughs> drove down the Hollywood freeway spitting at their window and <laughs> they did, learned, learned their lines. Uh, and then I, I was out on the set, so most of the time in, in, in the first couple of movies, well, actually the first three movies, are, the first three movies where Klingon speak that I was involved with, which, which, is, which is, if you know this numerology, you know, it's, it's three, five, and six. Um, 
most of the time when they're, when they're speaking Klingon, I'm just off camera because we've been running the lines and running the lines and running the lines just before. Uh, some of the actors took to it right away, picked it up very, very quickly. Some of them we had to work at it and work at it and work at it, and then they would finally get it. Uh, the, the, when you make a movie, as, as you know, when, when, you, when you shoot something, when, as soon as the scene is over, the director yells cut. And then the director will check with the sound person and the camera person. Did it look okay? Okay, did it sound okay? Did a truck drive by in the middle with someone off mic? You know, that sort of thing. And if it wasn't okay, all right, we'll do it again. They do it again for other reasons, too. We'll do it again. So they always would ask me, you know, did the Klingon sound okay? And I learned early on to say yes. <laughs> um, because time is money and all that stuff. Yeah. But they were, they were checking all the time. They wanted, wanted to make sure it was okay. And if, if the uh, actor said the line in a way that didn't sound like Klingon, and the, the, there was enough sense of what Klingon sounds like even in the, the early days, that you know, they would do it again. There's one scene in Star Trek III where the, the, the Klingon heavy's commander, Krug, uh, re refers he tells, he tells his gunner to shoot at another ship and just hit the engine. Not, don't blow the thing up, just to hit the engine. So he says the phrase, engine only, which is jontat nech. Jontat is the engine, nech only. So just the engine. Uh, and when the actor playing the, playing the role was Christopher Lloyd, before Back to the Future, uh, <laughs> uh, he said, blah, 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 jontat nech. <laughs> <laughs> and the, the director, who was Mr. Spock, you know, said, you know, no, 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 he's supposed to be talking Klingon, not French, you know. <laughs> do it again. But if it did sound like Klingon, even if it was the wrong thing, we'd let it go and I'd make a note. All right, he uh, said toe, he was supposed to say two, it's toe from now on. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but so even the people on the production side developed a sense of what Klingon sounds like, uh, yeah, and what, yeah, what yeah. sounds like Klingon and what yeah. doesn't. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, okay. Again, my experiences were, were, were somewhat similar. I developed what I thought was a very transparent orthography, spelling system for Na'vi. Uh, for example, for the ejectives, K'a was K-X and T'u was T-X and so on. Uh, but I found that uh, the actors really needed something in addition to that. So I came up with sort of a quasi pseudo phonetic english -y kind of transcription. So in addition to the actual not respelling, I would transcribe it where the sound oo was written o o and the sound e was written e e and uh, that, th that seemed to help. Yeah. Um, I had the opportunity to sit down with the seven actors who use the language to any extent in the movie, typically a couple of weeks before a particular scene was going to be shot. Uh, to go over the pronunciation with them. I also um, did, did, did tape, so to speak, actually MP3s, not in yeah, well, <laughs> like real, li little further along. Yeah, but we're only in the 23rd century. We didn't right, know. right. <laughs> <laughs> and um, someone advised me to berlitz the tape. So in other words, rather than giving them the complete sentence, I would give them parts of the sentence and then allow room for them to repeat, a pause for them to repeat, and then put the parts together into larger parts and so on until they finally got, got the sense. If you think about it, they had a really hard time. You know, no one has ever heard this stuff, this crazy sounding stuff. They have to memorize it because there's no cue cards. You know, when you're doing all this stuff, you can't be looking at cue cards. So they have to memorize it. They have to make it sound as if, their own, as if it's their own language. Uh, and they have to act. And, and all of that was, was really quite challenging. They all really wanted to master it, and they really wanted to rise to the occasion. And I think, in general, they, they did a very good job. I was on set for mm, the shooting of virtually all the scenes that involved the language to any, any extent. Um, as you know, typically, it's not just one take per scene. It's maybe seven or eight or nine takes per scene. And, as you might expect, the language varies. The accuracy of the language will vary from take to take. Uh, so I was there on set, and between takes three and four, for example, I might walk up to a particular actor uh, and say, you know, that was, the, 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 the not me was really good, but just make sure that this vowel is not ah, but ah. Okay. So sometimes the actors were very receptive to that. 
Uh, sometimes when they saw me coming, they would quickly run in the other direction because <laughs> they didn't want to do it. So it, it, you had to be a diplomat. You had to know when it was appropriate to do that and when it was appropriate to say, you know, I think I'm, I'm going to let it go. But um, <laughs> the, uh, when I heard the final results, in general, I, I, was, I was pretty pleased. Uh, every so often, I would hear something which I hadn't intended and which had come out. Because if you think about it, you know, which, which take of those nine takes is James Cameron going to choose? Well, I would like him to choose, of course, the take where the actor really nailed the language perfectly. But you know, that's not reality. Reality is he has a lot of things to think about, and uh, it's not necessarily going to be the best take in terms of the language, which is going to appear in the final film. So if I heard something that wasn't quite what I intended, uh, the first question was, does this fit into not me phonology? And fortunately, most of the time it did. So then I said, OK, well, what could it possibly mean? Could it fit into the grammar? And so I'm not going to give you the specific example, but um, it turns out there's a rather important word in Na'vi, which was coined by one of the actors, and the actor has no idea that, that that's exactly <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so from the other end of the spectrum, I still haven't been on set for Game of Thrones. I, <laughs> the, o the only actors I've ever talked to are the actors whose characters are dead. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's true. I, I, I've talked with Jason Momoa now, but it was after season two was done filming. Um, actually, for the first time ever, this is kind of a, a momentous for me. At, this, uh, at the season three premiere party, I talked with one of the actors whose character survives this season. <laughs> wow. Congratulations. Yeah, really. <laughs> uh, whereas... Uh, like, for, for Defiance, it's awesome. I talked to all the actors beforehand. I've been on set several times, and I experienced exactly the, thing, the same thing as, as, as Paul just described, which I didn't anticipate beforehand, which is that, you know, yeah, like there was um, one actor in the pilot, and I was there for this filming of the scene. He was having uh, absolutely no trouble with a really long line, pronounced it exactly the same way every single time, and it was perfect. And then there was another really short line, and he was just constantly screwing it up. And so I was, like, trying to help him work with him, and he got better and better and better and finally he was just nailing it uh, but of course when it finally got printed um, they chose one of the takes where he was not getting it and it's like at that point it's like I felt bad for him because it's like oh he worked so hard and he finally did get it but you know at the same time it's like the actors come to really know the language and really like have it in their heads and I really know the language and work with it and the writers get it to a certain extent but the directors and editors I mean not so much it's you know all the same to them <laughs> So, anyway, but uh, you got to sign over there. So. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, let's let's talk a little bit about the fans, and this is probably the more dangerous part of the <laughs> talk for for me, at least. Uh, so I want to tread carefully here, but but I'm wondering what you think about the fact that there are fans, not just of the programs, of course, or the movies, but of the the languages. And uh, so, so you created these languages for, for a very specific purpose, and now there are people who are investing major amounts of time in learning or even developing these languages. Um, does that make you happy, sad, <laughs> guilty, um, <laughs> uh, mixed feelings? Uh, I'm, I'm curious. Yeah. It, it, it First of all, it makes me surprised. Yeah. <laughs> but, but, but more than that, it brings me tremendous joy. It, it's just such an honor to know that there are people out there who are really devoting this incredible amount of time and energy to learn this language that I developed. And I must say, uh, at this point, there are people who actually use it better than I do, <laughs> who, who, who actually speak it and write it with more grace and more creativity than I do. And the reason is that they're using it every day. It's become a medium of genuine communication mm -hmm. all over the world. I mean, I'm, I'm not going to tell you we have tens of thousands of speakers, but we have a core community that is writing poetry and writing haiku and writing <laughs> prose. We have, we have, we have not the contests every year. I mean, it, it's, it's become quite extraordinary. And not only that, uh, one of the unexpected joys is that 
a community has developed, and I've made friends for life. So mm -hmm. it, it, I mean, I, I never thought that I would have that benefit, and it's, it's just been, been a joy. Huh. Well, I'm, uh, always, I'm really, really, really grateful to all nine of my fans. <laughs> you, think, you think I'm kidding. At least for, at least for Dothraki, I think there's nine, but we may have lost a couple. Um, so, uh, but I, I, I wasn't actually surprised by that, um, by that result. I kind of knew beforehand that uh, there, there was, I mean, you know, Dothraki is, I think, really, really popular amongst... Um, reporters and um, also uh, really, uh, really, really popular amongst uh, writers of NBC's um, comedies, the Thursday night comedies. Uh, uh, but, but, but outside of that, I'd say there, there's, really like, there's really probably exactly nine people who are really interested in learning it and, and kind of using it. Uh, and I met, I met two of them. Uh, they're very, very, very nice. Uh, one of them, uh, Clarissa, turned me on to this movie, Captain Blood, with Olivia to have one. Oh man, <laughs> that was that was incredible. But okay. um, <laughs> but you know, like even when this was announced back in April of 2010, they said you know uh, HBO's Game of Thrones is going to have you know the, the Dothraki language. Uh, even on the forums for uh, that were fans of the book series, uh, like the first thing was like, wow, that's, that's cool that they're doing that. So are they gonna do the High Valyrian language? And I was like, everybody was like, yeah, we wanna hear that language. It's like, yeah. <laughs> but eventually I did get to do that. So, you know, it's good. <laughs> but really, I mean, who, uh, the, the, the people that have looked at it all or uh, that are, you know, positive about it, it's like, you know, what, what more could you ask for? It's just so nice. Uh, and people in, mm -hmm. general, in general have been really very nice, and that's cool. Yeah. Yeah, and I like I like what both of them said. Uh, <laughs> I didn't. You, you couldn't remain silent if you. <laughs> <laughs> no, I I was surprised when it first happened. I mean, when we were working on on Star Trek Three, which is the first one with any extensive amount of Klingon in it, uh, various members of the crew, meaning the movie making crew, not the Enterprise crew, would would come up to me. <laughs> and say, oh, you're, you're the language guy. Uh, you know, it sounds like Arabic. It sounds like Russian. It sounds like, they, and they all said different things. Right? <laughs> Which so I think that was good. Yeah. That was good. Uh, and then they'd say, how do you say? You know, how do you say? And the most common thing they would ask me, since you brought it up at the beginning yourself, is I would say, they'd say, say something in Klingon. I'd say, what do you want me to say? They'd say, say, how are you? Hello, how are you? And I'd say, oh, a Klingon would never say that. And they go, ha, ha, ha. <laughs> <laughs> and they would go away. But I got tired of that as, as an answer. So that's where this nuknech thing comes from. And what it means is, what do you want? Right. <laughs> <laughs> so I wondered, in, I wondered, in fact, if what I had people do at the beginning was actually authentic. But I, but it, because probably what our mini conversation really was, was like, what do you want? And then response. What do you want? Right. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I have a question for my, for my colleagues here. Have you, um, have you had people ask you how to say something because they wanted to have a tattoo? Oh, oh yeah. <laughs> and I, you know, I, I'm, I feel kind of funny, but I'm, I'm a little bit reluctant to answer. I will say, look, here's how to say it, but think about this, okay? <laughs> You know, 50 years from now, are you absolutely certain that you want a Navi sentence tattooed on you or whatever? So. <laughs> no. No. Oh, per personally, I think it's incredible. Like, I would never, ever get a tattoo myself, but the fact that somebody would permanently, indelibly, you know, for the most part, ink something on their body, it's like, wow. So, like, you know, with Game of Thrones, that was cool, but the most recent thing is that, you know, for, the Defi for Defiance, I was able to develop... Um, some writing systems, which is actually the thing I like to do most when it comes to language creation. And then there was somebody for the first time asked, can I get my name in uh, the cast of the writing system? And I was like completely blown away. And I was like, yes, absolutely. I am so happy that you're doing this. And I was like, okay, now I just need to make sure I don't say anything that puts her off it. But uh, she got it. And so now uh, it says uh, Laura on, on her wrist. But then like what was even, uh, what even went even further than that was just a, a couple weeks ago, somebody asked me how to write something in Kamakawi, which is one of the languages that I created on my own. 
and, and I showed them and they got a tattoo of this in, in the writing system, which is like a, kind of like a, a hieroglyphic writing system. I was like, wow, <laughs> that's just about the coolest thing ever. It's like, I would never do that, but that is the coolest thing ever. <laughs> and you are my friend for life. I love you. Nice. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know if anyone's ever asked me for a tattoo. I know people who've gotten tattoos in Klingon and the Klingon writing system, which I did not create or, or yeah. really don't know much about. Uh, well, I know how it works because it doesn't work. Um, <laughs> because the, 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 the writing you, you've seen up until now anyway on the TV shows and, and in the movies is artwork. And there's been no attempt made to match the artwork to the spoken language. And people, people who, who do that are very careful that the Klingon writing in one, on one control panel you know, is a different jumbled up set of characters from the Klingon writing in another control panel because they do, they control different things. Uh, and the Klingon writing on the door is the same because it means exit or, or what have you. Um, so I've had people say, I want to put a tattoo on in Klingon writing. And I, oh, I'm not quite sure how it's not. The, the, the Klingon speaking community has adapted those characters in several different ways. Uh, so this is, this is an A, this is a B, and so on and so forth. And they, they use it and, and they can read it. Um, mm. But so far, anyway, that and, and what you see in the films is not, not quite a match. You know? yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, actually, with what you said, you just surpassed the, what I was expecting for the answer to my, uh, another question I was thinking of asking, which was what the most like, die-hard fans, what the most impressive right. things they've done. Uh, I'll, tell you what, won't... I'll tell you in my case what it is. There's okay. a website out there, a web page anyway, out there with a list of all the mistakes I've ever made. <laughs> wow. Yeah, I really hope they don't do that for me. Jeez. <laughs> so I, I thought maybe there was going to be, uh, you know, someone who gets pulled over for a traffic ticket and refuses to speak to the officer and anything oh. but Dothraki. Oh, wow. or <laughs> but, but getting a tattoo, that, that goes pretty far. <laughs> so we're going to move into a segment now where you can ask questions, and I'm sure much as you feel so inspired <laughs> to ask your questions. Uh, we don't have too much time, and I anticipate that there will be a lot of people wanting to ask questions, so try to keep your question brief, and if possible, address it to one particular panelist so that we don't, so that everybody gets a chance to ask their question. And we'll alternate between the two microphones, and just arbitrarily, I'll start on the left. Okay, well, uh, my question was for all of you, so <laughs> sorry. So the rules, <laughs> right? What did you guys all study in grad school? I mean, did it prepare you, or is it something relatively unrelated to, you know, conlanging? Should be well, a linguistic. Quick answer. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, but I mean, like, right, but, but more particularly, what I focused on was I, I, I focused on um, American Indian languages, mostly those in California, mostly those around the San Francisco Bay Area, all of which were not spoken by the time I got to them. So it was all dealing with manuscripts and things like that. And that prepared me for Klingon because when I was working on it initially, I hadn't heard it. So, same thing. <laughs> yeah, I, I uh, was a graduate student in linguistics, and I, 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 I would say that my courses prepared me pretty well, and also my experience with languages, because there's nothing like actually trying to learn languages yourself mm -hmm. to give you a clue as to what's, what might be involved in constructing it. And then um, I was at graduate school here in linguistics. Um, yeah, you bet. <laughs> it's one of my professors right here, and I TA for this book. It taught him everything he knows. Yeah. And um, the, for, for me, um, my linguistics and conlanging career were intertwined and inextricably. I created my first language during my first uh, linguistics class, and so they've been going hand in hand ever since. Uh, but there have been a couple of really key moments that, that changed things for me. For example, um, uh, learning about optimality theory from Eric Bakovich, for example, uh, there's nothing better for designing um, tense systems or tone systems than, than using OT. And then um, the, the stuff that I learned about from morphology from Farrell Ackerman, whose class was so good I took it twice, completely changed the way that I create and look at language. Uh, like, for example, uh, I no longer use morphemes as a theoretical construct because I think they're bad. <laughs> Let's move over here. Hi, this is a question for the uh, creator of Klingon. Um, given that, as the creator, I, I, I suppose your initial creation was more or less the Queen's Klingon, 
or BBC Klingon. <laughs> and as Klingon has been uh, learned and used by its, um, its fans, have you seen any regional dialects of Klingon, like uh. British versus American? <laughs> In, term, in terms of, of, of grammar and vocabulary, no, because they won't do anything unless I say it's okay. I've been accused of being a dictator when it comes to Klingon. That's not a decision or, or, or an appointment I made of, of myself. The Klingon-speaking community decided that's the way they wanted to do. In terms of pronunciation, on the other hand, uh, I was at a, at a meeting of Klingon speakers a few years ago, and this guy came in who no one had ever seen before. All these people know each other pretty well. Someone came in no one ever seen before, started speaking Klingon really well, with an Australian accent. <laughs> Everyone knew who he was, because they'd dealt with him online before, although they'd never met him, but they knew because this got the Australian Klingon, that's so and so, I know. <laughs> that's cool. And we got in an argument once, there was a, one time we had an international convention of Klingon speakers, it was in Brussels, and the German Klingons, and the American thing has gotten a big argument about how to pronounce <laughs> <laughs> And it's all my fault because in the book I say the, the sound, because we don't have that in English, so I was trying to explain to English speakers in writing you know, uh, what that's like. So I said, among other things, that's like the sound at the end of the composer name Bach. Well, that's the way Americans pronounce that composer name. If you're German, it's Bach. It's softer. And so the Germans said, no, it's a sh kind of sound. And the Americans said, no, it's a sh kind of sound. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's go over to the other side here. Hi, I work with the reconstructed systems of Greek and Latin, ancient Greek and ancient Latin, and I find them very thick. Um, I'm interested in the phenomenon of the thinness of the languages, where, where someone can say, yeah, I made up three or four languages already in my life, and I've got thousands of people speaking them now. At what point do you come upon the thinness of your language and you realize, you know, this is something that, that's made up. This doesn't have the cultural resonance that Greek or Latin would have. It's kind of a, a, a mean question, but maybe, uh, maybe you can speak to it. Um, well, I will say, I will say this. Uh, first of all, when you create uh, languages using a naturalistic approach, you start from a proto-language, so something like Proto-Indo-European, and then you evolve it throughout history. Now, like for something like George R. R. Martin's Game of Thrones, it can be tied to culture insofar as he has created the, the culture for Dothraki. So, for example, he hasn't said anything about how they measure the passage of time with regard to months or weeks or fortnights or whatever. Um, and so that area of the Dothraki vocabulary must remain blank until he provides an answer to that question. But um, to that extent, uh, first of all, it's, it actually is not difficult to create a full grammar. It can be done. You can actually have a fully fleshed out grammar complete with irregularities and, and cultural tidbits. The problem comes in fleshing out the lexicon, which takes a long, long time, pretty much uh, as long as you want to work on it. You know, Dothraki has yep. about 3,500 words, but you should have about eight to 10,000 if you want somebody to be able to speak like a second language learner. Of course, you know, uh, language like English is claimed to have a million, but like a high school graduate has about 50,000, right? And then as you specialize, you get even more than that. Um, it, it's something that you, even if you try to automate the process, uh, to do it authentically takes a very long time. And, you know, you just have to do the best that you possibly can. And that's what we try to do. Yeah, actually, I dealt with exactly that when I was writing the Klingon Dictionary, uh, because since these guys, these movie-making guys were interested in the language, I thought maybe fans would be too, so I got the idea of writing this book. And I wrote it's a, partly a grammatical description and partly a, a lexicon, a list of words. And if I put the words in the dictionary that were in the movie and nothing else, it would have been a really skinny book, because there wasn't that much, really, in the movie. So I had to expand the vocabulary, and deciding how to expand the vocabulary was much harder than describing the grammar or something like that, because I didn't, what, what are you going to make words of? It's not, not going to be everything. So I made an arbitrary decision, which sounds weird, but in this context, maybe not so weird. Um, I said, I'm not going to make up, I said to myself, I'm not going to make up any words other than the ones that were already made up for the movie that had anything to do with Klingon culture or Klingon geography, which sounds weird. Mm. But I'm not a story writer, I'm not a screenwriter. Mm. Okay? In the same way, the, in your case, mm. you know, you, he has right. to come up with it first. Yeah, right. It was the same thing. I said, I'll wait for them to put it in some movie or some episode or something. Then I'll tell them what it's called. <laughs> but not the other way. I've changed my mind about that, by the way. I have a different approach now. <laughs> yeah. 
I mean, it, it, it's, it's clear that every language exists in a cultural context, and, it, and, and to an extent it has to reflect the environment it exists in and, and the culture of, of, of its speakers. Um, there are certain clues as to what the culture is like of the Navi on Pandora. One, of course, is a movie. There are peripheral materials that have been published by Fox, which presumably have the blessing of uh, James Cameron. But there are other areas that are still mysteries, as you said. And so we've come up with this term Cameronian. And <laughs> there, are, there, there, there are certain things where if I were to begin developing vocabulary for that particular area, I would be infringing on an area that really doesn't belong to me. Yeah. So there are certain things that are going to have to wait in terms of developing vocabulary until James Cameron tells us what they're like. Mm -hmm. yeah. hey, back to so you guys actually sort of just answered mine, but I was going to ask how the culture of the race or people that you're developing a language for affects your process. And I guess you all sort of addressed that, but if you have any other... Yeah. Well, any, any other culture? Well, well I, I mean, it, it's, it's culture, it's physiology, for example. So one example I, I, I like to give is that when I was looking at the sketches for the Navi, I realized that they have four fingers on each hand and not five. Okay, so that said to me, wow, probably they don't have a decimal system of numeration. Probably they have an octal system. And so I mentioned to, to Jim, I said, what do you think, base eight? And he said, absolutely, go with it. And so the Navi counting system is base eight. So you count al, muna, e, sing, mr, puka, kina, vol, one to eight. And then nine is vola, which is eight and one, and 10 is eight and two, and so on. So that's part of it. Um, just in terms of the richness of the language and the expressions that are used in the language, uh, every language has its own set of proverbs, for example, that reflect what life is like, that reflect the environment. So um, in Navi, we have a proverb, um, which means the tail and ears also speak. Okay, and if you, if you watch the Navi in the movie, you realize that your tails and ears are very expressive, mm -hmm. and that body language is very important to communication. So those are, that, that, that's also part of, of the richness of language in a, in a, in a cultural context. Okay, let's move back over here. So, for this is a question that's addressed to all of you. What upcoming projects are you guys working on? And what, what can you also you? tell? Oh, yeah. Say again. Uh, what upcoming projects are you guys working on? And if you could tell me, us what TV show or movie or anything else, because <laughs> let, let's do a little spoiler here. Um, well, I'm, I, I worked, I, I did a language for a pilot uh, for the CW, but I can't tell you what its name is because they said that the name might be changing. So, um, and I also, I also worked in a language last year for a movie coming out this year that I can't tell you about. <laughs> <laughs> I, I can tell you uh, very definitely what I will be working on, I can't tell you when. Uh, Avatar 2 and 3 have been announced. Uh, yeah, <laughs> uh, and as, as far as we know, um, James Cameron is working on the scripts in New Zealand even as we speak, um, but we don't know the exact time frame, but I think it's going to be soon. Uh, it has been announced that two and three will be shot together and cut into two different movies, so um, I'm waiting by the phone <laughs> to hear, okay, you're going to get a script in the mail tomorrow, so we'll see. <laughs> so I'm not working on anything new right now. However, uh, I just finished very recently working on something that I can't tell you what it is, <laughs> but one month from now you'll know. <laughs> Therefore you know. Keep your eyes open. <laughs> I have another Hollywood question. Um, what about translations of the movies or shows and such into other human languages? Did your languages get translated? Did the subtitles get translated? Tell me no, anything. I'll, okay. tell you, I'll tell you my experience with that. Uh, I saw, it was probably at a Star Trek convention someplace, uh, uh, a version, I'm going to mess this up, I'm sure, but I'm going to try to remember how this worked. It was, a, it was a French version of Star Trek II. And Star Trek II is all in English except for one little scene that's in Vulcan and has English subtitles in the English version, has English subtitles. 
and the French version was subtitled in French every time they spoke English. But when they spoke Vulcan, they left the subtitles in English for the French people who didn't understand English to understand the Vulcan. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you know, um, the one thing that I was very surprised by is that Game of Thrones is dubbed a lot of places. Like, I don't understand why they would do that. Like, I, I just, you know, we, we, we don't like dubbed, dubbed things, we like subtitled things. But yeah, they actually do dub it and they had to come up with uh, pronunciation guides for like Dothraki, for all of the other uh, international uh, dubbing, you know, actors, and I've never heard any of it. I'd like to because I've heard some strange stories. But um, I, just for fun, though, I have come across subtitles from other like sites, uh, from a lot of Russian sites. So like, I had a lot of fun coming up with uh, how you would might do a, not a romanization, but a Cyrillicization of how you might write Dothraki with Cyrillic characters that actually generated a lot of interest from uh, Eastern Europeans. They're like, no, you shouldn't use that. And then um, I did one for Arabic as well, because you know, that was more familiar to me. Avatar is probably, <clears throat> excuse me, it's probably played in every, every country in the world. So it has been uh, dubbed into a lot of languages. So the question is, what do you do with the, the well, of the seven characters, one, Eitukan, speaks only Navi, and so there's no problem. You simply use that voice track, and there's no problem. But with the other six characters, you can't do that. The reason is that Neytiri, for example, speaks both English and Navi. So we can't have her sounding with one voice in one language and another voice in the other language. And so what I had to do was simply um, create sound files and tell the people in charge, send them off, and hopefully this will be a guide for the people who will speak it. And uh, I have not listened to the results, but I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm sure they're very, very good. <laughs> Let's go back to this. Um, this question is just for the creator of Dothraki. You had mentioned creating an orthography to go with your language. I was wondering in what sense is Dothraki phonetic related to its writing system? Does it strictly a one-to-one -one sound to symbol system, or did you imagine a historic component to it? Oh, okay, wait. Let me, yeah, let me clarify some terminology there. So I created a romanization system that is purely one-to-one -one because I think that's the most useful. Um, Dothraki themselves, they're said in the books to be uh, illiterate. They don't have a written form of their language, so I haven't, I haven't touched that. I just figured, you know, just use the romanization system. Some people, some fans have come up with uh, orth orthographies for them, but, you know, it's non-canon. Um, for the defiance languages, I have done written systems, and uh, both systems, I think, are technically abugidas. They're not alphabets, and uh, they're extremely complex. One of them is really, really regular. It's, it's worse than English, but not as bad as Tibetan. So, uh, <laughs> and, um, but yeah, the, the writing systems themselves are also evolved. Uh, and there's, uh, there's actually a, 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 a really good amount of literature that's done on the evolution of orthography. I recommend writing systems from the Oxford series, the, the, red, the red cover one. It's really, really neat. So, anyway. and you can see, oh, there's like a, a postcard out there. If you want to see what they look like, you can see them. Please take those away. I don't want to have any left. <laughs> uh, this question is for the creators of Navi and Klingon. Uh, the Klingons are a technological species. Uh, they've conquered their neighbors. Uh, the Navi are not technologically advanced. Uh, they're, they're susceptible to being conquered or have uh, human culture impressed upon them. How has this informed the creation of your languages? Well, vocabulary-wise, it certainly informed it. Yeah. Uh, for me, because I had to come up with the words for the technology. Uh, Klingon, Klingon culture, actually Star Trek alien cultures in general are very interesting because they're all technologically, not all, many of them are technologically very, very advanced, but they live in caves. You know, and, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but the, vocab the vocabulary had to, had to match what they're doing in terms of technology and stuff. There was a, a a declaration, if that's the right word, in the Wikipedia thing about Klingon that says, in Klingon, you can say bridge on a ship, but not bridge over the water. I've changed that, so they had to change Wikipedia. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, the Navi are not a technological culture. And so the problem comes when you need that kind of vocabulary in Navi. There are a few places in the movie, for example, 
in one version of the script, I'm not sure this actually made it into uh, the final version of the film. Um, during one of the battle scenes, and we were discussing the Sky People's gunship. So they had to use the words, how do you say gunship? in Navi, the totally non-technological culture. Well, there are a number of things you can do. One thing is to simply borrow the English word and filter it through the Navi phonological system. So gunship in Navi is kunsip. Uh, how do you say computer, if you need to say computer? Well, you could do the same thing and come up with something like computer. Uh, I did something different, which is what a lot of languages do, which is sort of use existing elements, create compounds, put them together in a way so that you get this other concept. So um, computer in Na'vi is el tulafna, which means metal brain. So that's, that's a way you can sort of get around these sort of cultural constraints for technology. Go back to the other side. The Klingon, Navi, and Dothraki are all proud warrior civilizations. How does that warrior aspect flavor the creation process for languages compared to a civilization that was more peaceful and, and sort of gentle? Well, you have a lot of words for hunting and for war and for warrior and, uh, and for honor and things like that. So those cultural concepts um, yeah, in terms of become vocabulary. vocabulary. Right. Mm. right. Mm. Okay. I, I agree. And, and grammatically, in Klingon anyway, mm. there's sort of a, a subset of the grammar or something that you use in battle, where you can drop off a lot of prefixes and stuff like that. You just get down to it. Go. You know. I, I think for uh, Dothraki, more of the influence was uh, the fact that they were a nomadic society. So that they, mm. they, they've got that kind of this one big city, but they don't really live there. They don't stay a lot of places. So um, there, there isn't like, you know, there isn't like a place suffix that says like, you know, I don't know what an equivalent would be in, in English, like maybe Uri, like a bakery. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Yeah, so it'd be, there's, there's kind of nothing like that. And then, you know, of course, plenty of, plenty of words for, for hunting and, and, you know, meat. <laughs> <laughs> Go back to this side. Right. This is a question primarily aimed at the creator of Klingon. So I've run across a story about a, a man who tried to teach his son Klingon as his first language, wow. and only spoken Klingon to his son for like three years. I'm wondering how you feel about that. I just got, <laughs> actually, I just, I, just, I just got an email from that kid a couple of days ago, um, <laughs> in English. Uh, the story is, the true story is, uh, the, the father is a, is a, was when the, when the kid was born and still is a really, really good speaker of Klingon. But at the, when the kid was born, he was a graduate student in linguistics at Georgetown University in Washington. Uh, his son is born, and with his wife's approval, uh, <laughs> he wanted to see, he, he, the, the plan was not to raise a bilingual kid. Okay, the, 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 what he wanted to see is, can Klingon be acquired as a natural language as opposed to taught? Because everybody who's, who, who spoke Klingon up until that point learned it from somebody or learned it from a book or learned from tapes or something like that. And if you, know, if you, don't, if you grow up monolingual and then take a Spanish class, you're learning the second language. Okay, that's fine. But the first language you speak, whatever that is, no one taught that to you. We talked about that earlier. No one taught that to you. It just happens. Okay, so he wanted to see if Klingon would just happen. So he would talk to his son in Klingon. Not all the time. He would talk to him in English, too. Um, but he would talk to him in Klingon. The mother never talked to the kid in Klingon. <laughs> And, as, as is, is normally the case, the kid learned to, or was able to understand before he was able to talk. So the father would say in Klingon, where is your nose? And the kid would do this. And where is your eye? And the kid would do this. He's, he was understanding. The first word that the kid actually said in Klingon is the word Kho, which means stop it, cut it out. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, Time went on, you know, the kid learned some other things. Uh, believe it or not, this may come as a surprise, when I was making up the vocabulary for Klingon, I did not make up a word for baby bottle. <laughs> it just didn't occur to me that that would be a useful word. And so there's no word for baby bottle. However, there is a word for drinking vessel of any kind. Anything you drink out of is the same word. So it could be a, you know, a wine glass or a coffee mug or a, a tumbler or anything you drink out of. 
And that word was used around the house, okay, but it was never used specifically to refer to the kid's baby bottle. Until one day the father said to the kid, go get me your drinking vessel, using, using that word. And the kid reached for the baby bottle first thing. And the father, it's working. Because no one told him that that's what that was called. And then once he saw it was working, he kind of gave up on the project. But my favorite thing, <laughs> my favorite thing is in a, in a bilingual situation, it's not just the case that there's two languages floating around. There's also uh, times you use one and times you use the other one. It's very intricate and patterned and not, not random. It's, you know, it's triggered by context or who's there or something or other. Well, the kid, when he got to be a certain age, started to learn how to count. And he wanted to count everything. And they had stairs in their house, right? So the kid's going up the stairs, and he's going wa, cha, wedge. The only other person in the room was his mother. Four, five, <laughs> six. <laughs> <laughs> the kid is a, is a sophomore in college. He's fine. Um, <laughs> I should say every linguist who has a kid thinks about doing that. <laughs> Not with Klingon, maybe, but thinks about doing something like that. Okay, I've been given, I've been given the zero minute warning, uh, which means that I'm going to stipulate, uh, because I'm up here and nobody else is, that we're going to have two more very quick questions with two more very quick answers. Okay, so one from either side starting over here. So I was wondering, uh, what got you into uh, linguistics and if you when you were younger uh, just made up a language okay. wait uh, what was the last part of the question sorry if like when you were younger you just oh, no, came like, up with the gibberish language kind of thing no in, in fact uh, well uh, actually uh, I don't even think even my wife knows this but I did have a word um, when I was very very young it was so manen and I said it just like that and it just I would just say it when I was feeling good um, <laughs> Like, I don't know, uh, when I was five or six. But no, I actually wasn't interested in languages at all in, uh, uh, coming up until like late high school, and then it just kind of hit me. But no, the reason I took a linguistics course and went into linguistics was because my mother told me that I should. <laughs> uh, I, I, wasn't, I wasn't gonna, but eventually I gave in. I just loved languages. I mean, uh, I started off fairly early as a Jewish kid in New York. I was sent to Hebrew school, and so Hebrew was my, my first foreign language. My, Folks spoke Yiddish at home. They actually spoke it when they didn't want my brother and me to understand, but, but still, it, it, kind of, it kind of fired up something in me. I had some French in, in high school. I had Latin in the seventh grade, four nice. years of Latin from, oh, from seven, which was amazing. And so it, it kind of built, built from there. Yeah, I never heard of linguistics uh, until I got to college. And the first, I went to UC Santa Cruz at the beginning, and everyone had to take the same course, all the freshmen had to take the same course, and this course was called Language, Culture, and Society. Mm -hmm. And if you think about it for half a second, there's nothing that can't be included in that, including physics. <laughs> <laughs> and I think, I, I don't, I've never got this confirmed, but I'm absolutely convinced that the faculty put the course together the day before the students arrived. You know? And there was, it, was, it, it turned out to be really good because it was an introduction to the faculty and an introduction to the discipline. So it was really fun, you know, and all, the, all these different things. And then you got to kind of say, oh, I never thought about that before. Maybe I'm going to study that a little bit. And the part that grabbed me the most in all that was, was linguistics. So I took linguistics one, and here I am. <laughs> I took that same course several years later, and it was called language, sex, and death. So <laughs> <laughs> that's what we called it. Okay, so one more quick question and quick answers, please. Go ahead. I was wondering if you have a favorite word. <laughs> my, I guess my favorite word is kind of strange. It doesn't, it doesn't mean anything interesting, but like in, in, in Dothraki, if you have to say need, uh, zigere, and that means need and don't need a zigere. And I don't know. The, you can say them really, really fast, and so whenever I had to use it in a translation, I was like, yeah, this is cool, but it doesn't mean anything interesting. It just means <laughs> need in the present tense, not in the first person. <laughs> I have uh, two favorite words. One is mewa uniaea, which I, I coined before I had a meaning for it, because it has a lot of vowels. With it. Not it has vowel clusters. So um, it turns out that it means um, living in accordance with the balance of life, which is kind of nice. And my other favorite word is skown, which means idiot. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'll have two favorite words, too. Um, 
when I, when I was working on the, on the thing, I, on the film, uh, I was thinking, <laughs> <laughs> I wonder if there's going to be one word that comes out of this that people are going to know and recognize that's Klingon, even if they haven't seen the film or, or don't know how the language works or something like that. And there is, it, it turns out, and it's Kapla, which pe people know, although, see? Um, <laughs> and I've seen it in all kinds of things, spelled in all kinds of weird ways, but so that's, there's that. Uh, and the other one, is, is the Klingon word for root beer. <laughs> I wasn't going to have a Klingon word for root beer, but in one of the episodes, you know, uh, Worf in Next Generation drinks some root beer and, and says, ah, oh, a warrior's drink or something like that. So he needed a Klingon word for root beer. Uh, the, way, the way Klingon grammar works is you have uh, two nouns that you want to say both of them. So in English, we join them with and, A and B, okay? You know, cars and trucks or something. In Klingon, you put the and at the end. So it'd be trucks, cars, and, all right? Uh, the Klingon word for root beer is au je. The word for and in Klingon is je. Au is A-W. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so I'm back to my cue cards here, sorry. Uh, so this concludes our event this evening. Uh, please join me in thanking Mark, Paul, David, and Grant. And believe it or not, there's several other entities and people to thank. Uh, thanks also to the Linguistics Department, the Social Sciences Dean's Office, the Department of Literature, and the Department of Communication for their generous sponsorship of the event tonight. A very big thank you is in order for Robert Klinder and Grace Arellano for the enormous amount of work that they put into organizing this event. So let's thank them all, please. And last but not least, thank you all for coming to our event. This has been a really great turnout for giving us an opportunity to tell you a little bit about what linguists do, or at least what some linguists do. Uh, and stay tuned for future UCSD linguistic events. You can just go to our website, ling.ucsd.edu, and you'll find out all about it. Or linguistics.ucsd.edu also works. Um, please get some informational material in the table over. It's in the back now. It's the one that you ignored on the way in. Uh, and please consider making a donation for our cause. This was a free event. I hope you enjoyed it. And if you have a, like some spare change or something that you can plop in there, that would be great. And enjoy the reception. Thank you. <laughs>